Um, all right, if you've got your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Uh, that is where we're going to be spending our time this morning. In Isaiah chapter 53. Mm. Uh, in the title of this morning's message, if you, if you like to take notes, if you want to take notes, uh, the title of this morning's message is Future Hope. Uh, because as you'll see in, this mo- in the passage for this morning, Isaiah is prophesying uh, the hope that's to come in the death and resurrection of Jesus. And so as we look at this this morning, that is the title of our message is Future Hope. Uh, I hope you all had a fantastic week. Last night I had the privilege uh, to be a part of uh, a really close friend's wedding. Um, I wasn't his best man, but I was second to best man, uh, so I'll kind of take it, but it it is what it is. Um, Some of y'all may know him. Uh, Josiah got married yesterday. He was an intern here two years ago uh, as he was finishing up his schooling at North Greenville. Um, and so he got married yesterday, and it was, um, it was a great time. And, and I love weddings. Number one, free food. Who doesn't love free food? Uh, number two, free dancing. Who doesn't love free dancing? Uh, and number three, um, there's just so much happiness and joy uh, that comes with a wedding. Uh, and, and everybody's smiling, and everybody's taking pictures, and, and we all love it. Um, and a big thing for weddings uh, is that it resembles our relationship with the Father. Um, because we see many times in Scripture that we are called the bride of Christ. And so spiritually speaking, our relationship with him is an eternal one. Just like when you choose the person that you're going to marry and you say, I do, like you're, you're stuck with them forever. Uh, based in, in front of God and everyone, like that is, that is a marriage. You are there until uh, the good Lord calls us home. And, and in the same way, your relationship with the Father uh, is an eternal one. It's, it's from here in the present till uh, we see him in uh, eternity and we spend that with him forever. Uh, and so this relationship with him can't be broken. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of my favorite passages uh, in the Bible that kind of speaks to this is John 15. And Jesus is, is standing there with his disciples and there. He's giving this, them this illustration of, of a vine and a branch. And so how, how he is the vine and how we are the branches. And so how we've got to be grafted into him, how we've got to remain in him, how we have to abide in him, how we have to uh, bear much fruit, and how we have to love others. Uh, And and in John 15, 5, he says this, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, and apart from me, you can do nothing. And so when it comes to this relationship with the Father, apart from him, we can't do anything. Uh, a marriage relationship is tricky. Uh, it takes sacrifice. It takes hard work. It takes putting your partner above yourself. And when I think of sacrifice and when I think of hard work and, and putting others above yourself, I think of what Jesus has done for us. Because without Jesus, without his sacrifice, without what he had done for us on the cross, a relationship with the Father is something that can't happen. And so as we look at the passage in Isaiah 53 this morning, uh, my goal is uh, lots of times pastors will come up and, and we'll preach and we'll give you things to do and what not to do. Uh, but this morning I want to um, ex- extol and exhort you. I want to encourage you this morning. Uh, for those of us in the room who you've been believers for a long time, and for those of you in the room who may not be believers yet, I want to encourage you that there is still hope. There is still hope in the future. And so if you will, we're going to look at Isaiah chapter 53 this morning. You can stay seated uh, as we read this out loud together. But Isaiah 53 says this. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their face, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our 
iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray, each of us turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to be slaughtered, and as a sheep before his shears in silent, he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living for his transgression uh, of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his, yet, in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied by his knowledge. My righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils of the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Lord, I pray for my message this morning. Lord, I pray that as we... As we open this up, Lord, as we expound on what Isaiah 53 is trying to teach us uh, and is trying to make us look at, Lord, I pray that your words uh, would speak through me. Lord, would we get something from this morning? And Lord, would we be able to apply it to our lives and take it out into the world with us? In your name, pray. Amen. So as we we look at this um, and as we read Isaiah chapter 53, nothing of this sounds like hope. Because all you see is that, that there was this person and he was led to be slaughtered and he was killed and he was put in a grave and he uh, had to carry the sins of a lot of people. Like nothing sounds really good about what we've just read. But a freest life is a life lived in Jesus. And when we understand that freedom is found in Jesus, we can understand that freedom isn't really free, is it? Because if if we're going to be free, if we're going to live in Jesus, it comes at a price. And we see that this price is the life of Jesus. And so before we begin, hope has a price. Your hope, my hope of eternal life, of of living with Jesus and living with God forever, it has a price. And so this morning, we're going to look at this future hope that is found in him. So if you're taking notes, number one, by the way, there's alliteration, so there's going to be uh, P's in every one of this. And so number one, there's power in suffering. And so when it comes to our Hope when it comes to the future hope that, that is to come because of what Jesus has done for us, there's power in suffering. And we see it in starting in verse 1. Um, if you will, it says, Who has believed our message, and to whom, if you want to circle this, has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Uh, at the close of f- chapter 52 in Isaiah, um, the prophet foretells the Gentiles' response. Uh, to the gospel. Uh, Nation and kings will bid it welcome, so they're going to welcome it uh, into their lives. Um, Those who have not seen it, they're going to believe it. Uh, And even though they don't know the gospel grace of Jesus yet, they will give it its due weight and consideration. And so we see that at the end of chapter 52, and here at the beginning of chapter 53, the author turns to the Jews. All right, and so so as you're looking at this, you've got to understand that the Gentiles were people that should not know who Jesus is. They weren't raised up in religion. They weren't raised up uh, under the Abrahamic covenant. They don't know any of what God's done for them. They don't, they don't recognize his faithfulness of what he's done. And so that's the Gentiles in 52. And then in 53, we look to the Jews who should know this. They should recognize what God's done for them. They should remember his faithfulness. And as, as we look at it, and as we're going to read it, obviously, when it comes to the New Testament, and when it comes to when Jesus is here on earth, and he's, he's doing miracles, and he's teaching the gospel, and he's teaching about hope, and he's teaching about all these things, the people that should know who he is have forgotten it. And Isaiah foretells it right here in chapter 53. But even for those who have forgotten, there's still hope. And Isaiah lets them remember it. And so... A few things. Suffering leads to salvation of the world. We've, we just read about it in chapter 53. Suffering leads to 
salvation, but many would reject the suffering servant. Uh, it says, who has believed our message? Obviously, uh, Isaiah anticipates that no one's going to believe what's been said and what's been prophesied about Jesus. No one's going to believe that he was the Savior who came. No one's going to believe that he was the Savior that died uh, and that is going to raise again. He says, who has believed? So obviously there's an anticipation that no one's going to believe it. And we understand that in the future, Jesus was put on a cross because no one believed who he was. Yet, you've got an entire Old Testament that talks about who he is. Um, in verse 1, they question his belief. Uh, but here's where, so when I say that there's power in suffering, if you want to underline this, uh, it says, arm of the Lord. Anytime that the word arm or anything like that is mentioned, it's a symbol of power. Uh, for all the teenagers and young, young people in the room, if you know how emoji, emojis work, uh, there's an emoji that looks like someone's flexing, right? And so that's, I think that that's a national and, and, and worldwide symbol for strength. And so as you're reading this, and it says armor of the Lord, I just, in my head, I imagine this emoji, uh, if, if, if the Bible was written in emojis, I just imagine this one right here, that Jesus is this arm of the Lord, that he is the strength. But it doesn't really look like there's strength, is it? Because he's put on a cross and he, is, he suffers for mankind. And so there's questioning of belief, but we see that there's power that comes through the Lord. In verse 2, we see a picture of insignificance. So even in insignificance, there's still power to the name of Jesus. We see that he's mentioned to be a tender shoot. Uh, my mom and grandma, she's in the back, so this is perfect. They love to garden, all right? And so I remember most, lots of summers we would, boy, whew, this tiller. We didn't have a tractor. It's one that you get behind and you push and you're doing all these things, right? And so you're tilling up the land, uh, and you, you plant the seeds, and you put it in the ground. And I just want you to think about how tender that newborn little plant is. It's just been sprouted. How easy is it for something to come by and just take it up? For something to just come by and rip it up out of the ground? Here we see Jesus is mentioned as this tender shoot, something that's weak. But we see that in verse 1, it's actually strong. And then we see that he's mentioned uh, that he grew up like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. Now, if it's you and I, I understand that growing plants, you need water. So how does, how does something with significance grow from something with zero to little water? Um, when we look at this, uh, Jesus actually grew up in Galilee, uh, which is a region of the Roman-controlled empire of Palestine. So spiritually speaking, Jesus grew up in a dry place. He grew up where no one really believed. I believe uh, in the New Testament, it even speaks that Jesus' own family didn't believe who he was. That his own family didn't believe that he was the son of God, that he came to be the savior. And so when it talks about him growing up in a dry ground, Jesus did. But God can bring the most wonderful things out of dry ground. Some of us this morning may think that we're in dry ground. You may think spiritually, God, I'm so dry. The world in which I'm living in, the, the, the business world or my job, man, it's so dry. God can bring the most wonderful things out of dry ground. And then he continues. I mean, Isaiah's just bashing Jesus right here, okay, because he's just foretelling it. He says he grew up like a tender shoot out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire. So we see, again, that this savior this person who is coming to suffer he has no beauty so physically speaking no one should be attracted to jesus and so when, when we look at this the, the servant the suffering servant who came to die for us uh we see that there's a lot of in quotation marks insignificance to it because he was weak because he grew up as a tender shoot because he came out of dry ground he was unattractive to a lot of people but our hope comes from the second part of verse 1 where it says, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Because this suffering servant, the one who came to give his life, was strong. Because even in our weakness, there is still strength. For someone who was supposed to be the Savior, I would think that he would have been more popular. Maybe powerful like Samson, right? I think of someone just 
mighty and strong. Yeah, he, Samson messed up. That's not the spiritual aspect. But he was strong. And at the end of his life, he took down pillars and, 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 and tore things. And so I'm thinking of someone who is powerful. Or maybe someone who was lifted up like David. Someone who's called the, um, a man after God's own heart. And then even someone like, as handsome as Moses. Because we see that he's mentioned as someone who is real good looking and, and pleasing to the eyes. And we know that because Pharaoh's wife, uh, Potiphar's wife went after him. And so this is the kind of person that I'm thinking is going to be our savior and our Messiah. Someone strong. Someone powerful. Someone lifted up. Someone who's praised as a king. But our servant comes like a tender shoot. He comes from dry ground. Because he came to suffer for us. And so, point number one, there is power in suffering. Point number two, there's peace in suffering. When when we look at the life of Jesus and and what he he gives up for us, peace is the uh, product of what happens. Uh, If you look at verse four, it says, surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet he We considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The Messiah made our griefs his own. He made our sorrows his own. The picture is that he took everything that that weighs down on your life and put it on his back. And he carried it to the cross with him. Uh, I saw this picture and I was trying to figure out, you know what, I'm going to use it with these chairs. Uh, because this is kind of what, this is what happens um, in our lives uh, when it comes to Sunday mornings. Um, maybe you've messed up. Maybe you've screwed up this week. It's a burden that you're carrying. Maybe something's going on in your life that you can't get over. A hump that you can't get over and it's a burden and 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 we walk in the doors of this church and we act all hunky-dory all the time and we smile and we say hey how are you doing and we always lie because we always tell them we're doing really good and you know it's good to see you but maybe you don't want to see them at all like this like this is how we come into church most Sundays with the burden strapped on our backs and in and in Psalms it tells us that when we come to this place of worship we should lift up our hands but how can I lift up my hands in worship of the Father when I've still got burdens being carried by myself? And so it's this picture of when Jesus comes and, and he carries our burdens, he takes them from us. And all we've got to do is lay them down so that we can worship him fully. That's all we got to do. But sometimes we like to just carry them. Sometimes we don't like to be open with those around us. Sometimes... We don't want people to know what's going on in our lives. The Christian life is tough. The Christian life is hard. And God calls us just to lay down our burdens, just to give our griefs and sorrows over to the Father. And he's going to carry them for us. Griefs dig graves, and that's what Satan wants. Our griefs, your griefs, your sorrows, it digs us in our own grave. And those are hard to come out of until we ask him to give us a ladder to to climb out of it. And that only happens when we give our griefs over to him. We see in verse 4 that he took on our pain, that that he bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. Christ carried our pain and suffering. He suffered in my place. Peace is a product product of his obedience, not mine. The peace that I can have, the peace that I have because of my relationship with the Father, is nothing that I've done. It's only because of Christ's obedience to what God called him to do. Uh, And healing is found in suffering. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The healing of a sinner is not found in him or herself, who they are, what they've done, what they feel, what they vow, or even what they promise. The healing of a sinner is found in the stripes across the back of Christ. 
Healing is found in the blood that was shed. Healing is found in the humble sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Peace is found in suffering. Maybe not, it's not your suffering. I need us to understand this. Peace is not found in you suffering or you giving up or you doing something. Peace is only found because of Christ's suffering. And that's where healing is also found. So there's power in suffering. There's peace in suffering. And don't, don't get me wrong because I'm going to explain this one in a second. There's prosperity in suffering. There's prosperity in suffering. If you want to get this, understand this. The suffering of the servant was ordained by the Lord. We see in uh, verse 10 that it says, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and to cause him to suffer. Uh, I I can't go into every detail of this um, theological point, but here it is. Jesus Christ was always plan A. When God created the earth, Jesus was plan A. Before Adam and Eve ever sinned, Jesus Christ was plan A. A lot of us may think that he was plan B, that he was sent because of our sin, that he was sent uh, for all these things. But if if the will of the Father was to crush him, then we know that it was always plan A. And so Jesus was sent to suffer. Even when the Israelites performed sacrifices in the Old Testament, Jesus was plan A. It was the Father's will to crush the Lord. The suffering of Jesus made grace sufficient. The suffering of Jesus made grace sufficient. Because we see in the Old Testament that when they messed up or they screwed up or it came to that day of having to give sacrifices like we've read a thousand times in our CBT, uh, we knew that they always had to do it again and do it again and do it again. Grace wasn't sufficient in those. When Jesus came to suffer, grace became sufficient. The sacrifice of Jesus was not the end. He lives. Uh, It says, yet crushed, caused him to suffer, and though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hands. He's going to see his spiritual descendants. Jesus is alive today. So we know that he's going to see him. Uh, His days have been and will be prolonged. And he's no longer, and we are no longer under the curse of death. Jesus lives. And when I, at the beginning, when I said that there's prosperity in suffering, it's not our prosperity. It's Christ. It's Christ because we see that through it comes eternal life. Prosperity is found in a relationship with God, not in materials given by God. You will only prosper in relationship with the Father. Yeah, you might have good, a nice house or a good car or a nice family or some land or whatever, but that's not prosperity. Prosperity is found in relationship with the Father. The suffering of Jesus only brings him more glory. Philippians 2, 10 through 11 says this, that, the name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus gets the glory. When it comes to his suffering, when it comes to us putting our faith in that and having a relationship with him, he's the one who ultimately gets the glory, not us. And so when I say that there's prosperity in suffering, it's not for us. Jesus is the one who prospers. We just reap a little bit of the benefit by having a relationship with him. And so how do we we apply Isaiah 53 to our lives? Number one, you can have hope. When it comes to reading about the suffering servant and all that he's done for us, you can have hope. But remember, it comes with a price. Your hope for the future, your hope for eternal life, it comes with a price. Jesus came and suffered, showing Christ's most undefeated power. Jesus came and suffered to offer us peace. Jesus came and suffered so that we could live in eternity. He took on our sins. He took on our 
griefs. He took on our sorrows. He paid the price. He atoned for the sins that we deserve to pay for. And we don't deserve it, yet we can have it. So, two questions for us in here this morning. Number one, have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus? Because he came to die and to suffer so that we could live for eternity. So that we could have hope for the future. Have you put your faith and trust in him? And then number two, does your life reflect what Christ has done for you? Does your life reflect it? Whenever you leave church, whenever you go home, whenever you go to work on Monday, does your life reflect the hope that you have? Can I say that my life reflects what Jesus has done for me? I want to end it with this. Uh, in Luke chapter 23, we see a picture before Christ is crucified of him and two um, other criminals on the cross beside him. And one of them puts their faith in Christ. The other one doesn't. And so I want us to, as, as, as I end with this, I want you to know it's never too late. It's never too late to put your hope in him. It's never too late to put your life into him and to surrender everything to him. Uh, Luke 23, 39 through 43 says, One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked that one and said, Don't you fear God? He said, since you are under the same sentence, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man, he did nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered, truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. There's still time. Let's put our hope and our future hope in what Christ has done for us because he suffered there's power in suffering there's peace in suffering and there's prosperity in suffering